Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Current Yield, the Grant's Interest Rate Observer podcast. I am Jim Grant, and with me as always, Eric Whitehead, our engineer, the controls, uh, the great Evan Lorenz, deputy editor of Grant's, and Phil Grant, the editor of Almost Daily Grant's, today being one of those almost days. We're not publishing a DG today because basically, I think Phil doesn't feel like it is a short of it. Um, and with us today, joining us presently, will be Sabrina Fox, who is an authority on leverage finance and who is, I think, the founder of uh, an organization called Alpha Exco, which wants to stand up for investors in uh, leverage loans and junk bonds and other such things, high yield debt in Europe principally. No, Evan, I think that's the case. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so she'll be joining us in a moment and we'll be most uh, welcoming to her because she knows stuff. Did, did I have mentioned, gentlemen, today we have sponsors. This is... Um, you know, every podcast, of which there are, I think, a few, needs sponsors, and we have two. And there we thank them. One is um, uh, Pitney Bowes, who is going to tell us, uh, we're going to tell them about SendPro. And you, too, send, about SendPro online from Pitney Bowes and ZipRecruiter.com. So, Evan, remember the commercial called uh, for uh, Wendy's, maybe, and the tagline was, where's the beef? Yeah, I, I, I remember that. All right. Do we not have an analog today in our financial affairs? Yeah, all the meatless companies seem to be getting higher and higher valuations. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, this so much about this contemporary world that uh, I must say eludes me. Um, we have in our family uh, a near vegetarian, and uh, from time to time we serve meatless hamburgers. That's they're they're on they're they're in inventory yeah. in, in the fridge. Right, and uh, Phil, uh, without naming names or without um, making unwanted editorial comments, you ever taste one of these? Uh, no, I, I can uh, safely uh, uh, withdraw myself from contention. All right, so we know nothing about it. Evan, uh, I, I am a reformed vegetarian. Now, I've actually eaten these. They're okay. Okay, but I mean, if you have the choice between like a, a hamburger or like a Beyond Meat burger, you're going to go for the hamburger. Okay, well, let's, let's let's get down to the main course here, which is not how we feel subjectively and perhaps irrelevantly about uh, vegetarianism and uh, meatless hamburgers, but tell us about the company. So the company has only had a short life in the public eye. It came public, I believe, on uh, May 1st. Do we have a name for this company? It is called Beyond Meat. Uh-huh. Uh, it came public at a share price of $25. As we are talking right now, I believe it is at $88. So it's been a, a pretty good IPO appreciation. The company now sports a $5 billion market cap. It does not make any money in the last 12 months it generated revenues of 88 million that's with an m is it with an m and the market cap is uh five billion with a b but it's not the only meatless company to uh to kind of find the market's favor in fairness to the backers of this and the visionaries who founded it uh, meatlessness is a thing you know it's like no more plastic straw it's the uh it's maybe the the gustatory counterpart to uh, uh, so much of the environmental uh, awareness that is uh, very much at the center of our culture as well as our politics. Well, there's a lot to be said for Beyond Meat's uh, goal. Um, Growing a a burger from the ground as opposed to a cow uses less carbon, it uses less land, it's more friendly. The question is... To, to, the, to the cows. The, 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 to the cows, Certainly too. The, the cows. question is kind of what multiple do you want to put on that? And when you're putting a $5 billion revenue, uh, a $5 billion market cap on something that's generating $88 million in revenue, it seems a bit rich for me. I know. Well, so I, I, I confess that I, I find this uh, deeply annoying. I think perhaps because I'm a resident, as are you gentlemen, of the state of New York, and, and specifically of the city of New York, and our mayor, Bill de Blasio, to whom the, well... Nee Warren Wilhelm, that's his original yeah. name. But the post refers to our mayor as Blas, which I think is apropos and fitting. Anyway, Blas has come out and said that New York City public schools ought to be meatless, what, on, on Tuesdays? Meatless Mondays. Meatless yep. Mondays. I remember watching uh, as a kid, World War II was not then being fought. I was born in 1946, but the aftermath of the war was uh, still very much a, a present thing in the minds of the people of, of the world. And there had been something I remember, it's called Meatless Tuesdays. I think that was a defense wartime measure to conserve food. And then Meatless Monday seems to be riffing on a very different uh, national priority. But anyway, that's blahs. Well, well you got to give blahs one thing over World War II. What? Better what? alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> well, any, anything else? So, so meatlessness and high valuations is one feature of our financial lives. Anything else? Well, I think we can explore this topic a little bit more. There's um, a little company called WeWork. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It's not so little. It's not so little. It has a $47 billion private market valuation. They've apparently filed confidential papers with the SEC to go public. As you may know, they've banned meat from company get-togethers. I did not know that. They do. They, they've also tried to limit employees to only four beers a day at, while at the office. That's right. That's right. Um, in addition to, to uh, banning meat at company events, you're also no longer permitted to expense uh, to uh, any any meal that features meat uh, back to the company when you're, when wait, you're traveling. Wait, a second. I'm, I'm trying to put this together. So no meats, right? But yeah. four beers. Yeah. I don't know how it works with you, Eric, but um, the first beer on an empty stomach is nothing short of fabulous. Is this what, <laughs> is this what we're getting at? 
<laughs> a, a wise man once called that the uh, booyah zone. I'm not sure what he meant by that. Yeah, there is a fantastic long form article in Bloomberg today about WeWork. It actually talks a little bit about the founder who is, in addition to running WeWork, which is the largest uh, single tenant in New York City right now, he's also starting a real estate fund that is going to own the buildings or own stakes in buildings in which WeWork is a tenant. The belief being that because WeWork adds so much value to the buildings it, uh -huh. it, it, it participates in, the value of the real estate uh, stakes is going to go up. Yeah. And uh, on this note, the um, the piece is just terrific. There's a, there's just a, a number of just you know outstanding quotes and and um, both from the author and fr and from uh, Mr. Newman, the CEO. Uh, perhaps my favorite is concerning this this new um, investment company called Arc buying the stakes in the in the buildings. He says everyone wants to know what Arc is. I think it's going to be amazing. Close quote. I, I th still think the best quote is going to go to uh, Scott Crow, who's the chief investment officer at Center Square. He says they don't make money even when the economy is roaring. If the economy softens, the receivables go away. Yeah. Well, I don't think the economy is roaring. It is roaring uh, in comparison to, I mean, it's was last uh, GDP. Uh, did you say 3.2. Right. But Evan, I, th I think you, you added up the... Um, uh, the growth since, uh, as measured since the uh, Trump administration began, is 2.8 percent GDP per annum, right? And so, uh, I believe compounded since uh, he started office. Right, and uh, under Obama, I think second term was 2.3 percent those four years. So what? Uh, 2.8 over 2.3 is what a 20 percent improvement, which is not nothing, but 2.8 is still like blah. It's, it's little, not amazing. Right? No, it's, but anyway, so uh, anyway, but the economy is better than it had been, certainly as measured by GDP. But I have a quote to contribute to our quote contest in this very fine piece in Bloomberg Business Week. Yeah, it's a publication. But Mr. Newman, the uh, the CEO, is is kind of a new age guy. Uh, so uh, he says that um, that what he is about with respect to residential real estate, that's a new point of interest for WeWork, is that uh, we want to make sure that, that no one's alone. Now, I don't know about you guys. No, thanks. But one of the great joys in life is uh, is being alone, is it not? I mean, not, okay, uh, sounds a little strong. That sounds almost misanthropic. Let me, let me try to recast this and walk this back somewhat. Sometimes you got to be alone, right? Shower, uh, other <laughs> reading. What's reading is good to be alone. It's a good thing. Uh, yeah. I, I think you're talking to a generation that can't get by the day without actually, you know, sharing what they ate for breakfast on social media. Yeah. But only if it's not meat. All right. That's right. You know, doesn't that remind you, uh, you're talking about people now, are we not? And it reminds me, if it doesn't remind you, of uh, people that one might hire. And, but it, ladies and gentlemen, if you are hiring, and I know it's difficult these days, is one place to go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart, a place where growing businesses connecting to qualified candidates can, uh, can do their work. That place is ziprecruiter.com slash grant. Now, a ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each and spotlights the one, the top candidates, so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. I'm supposed to say this one more time, except you're, okay, fine. ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. We are about to be joined by a person who needs to have her, uh, her views on the air. And we have talked, Evan and Phil and Eric, we have talked for a while in this publication about the long, not so slow deterioration in the quality of credit. People talk about the quantity of credit and about the ratio of debt to this and that denominator, such as GDP or uh, cash flow or adjusted cash flow. And by the way, WeWork adjusts its cash flow and doesn't stop there. It keeps adjusting it. Yes, uh, their their favorite metric is uh, community adjusted EBITDA, which if I have my numbers right, is adjusted, adjusted, adjusted earnings. Well, that means that three times is good. Oh yeah, that's it's, right. it's like triple distilled whiskey. Right. Smoother. So we have talked about this for ages. In fact, grants really is about not just interest rates, of course, but about debt and the quality thereof. And uh, we have bemoaned for many a moon the characteristics of today's market. Uh, not least the absolute evisceration of uh, covenant protection in the fine print of leveraged loans and uh, junk bonds. We were on the phone with uh, our friends from, uh, I'm going to say friend. okay, fine. I have not earned their friendship. Acquaintances. Acquaintances, yeah, our business acquaintances, actually Evan's friends are my friends too. 
And they told us that uh, a certain junk bond issuers are now issuing securities with investment grade covenants, that is to say, about none. <laughs> so uh, uh, what we need what we need is Sabrina Fox and her report from the field, that field covering Europe, where they used to have interest rates, but they have no longer. So Sabrina's career kind of covers the whole span. She's worked as a lawyer arranging deals. She's worked as the head of credit research in Europe for leverage loans. And now she works at the European Leverage Finance Alliance, which is a group that actually represents buyers of credit trying to improve terms and educate the market about just how bad everything is. Yeah. Well, you know, thanks to Sabrina and people who like her do the Lord's work, she is going to make a heck of a witness for the inevitable investigating committees that uh, are raking, going to rake the ashes of this current cycle when it burns to the ground. Oh, um, hey, uh, before we hear from Sabrina, I have, I have, I have two things to do. I have, I have, well, one thing in particular. This, this harkens back to WeWork. Ladies and gentlemen, forgive the, uh, uh, the apparent lack of organization of my thoughts, but they come to me sometimes spontaneously. And I would like to, um, to claw back in time to our discussion of real estate and its, uh, its promotion through WeWork and other avenues and quote uh, something that was said recently or a few months back uh, by the head of uh, a new age real estate brokerage firm called Compass. And uh, the head and the founder, I think, of Compass, Mr. Refkin, a co-founder of Compass, uh, said this with respect to the former uh, priority in a business of uh, taking in more than you pay out. That used to be the, po the point. Here it is, Mr. Refkin, quote, short-term profitability is something that many of us of the more modern companies are not as focused on, close quote. To which the Compass Chief Operating Officer, Mael Gavay, was quoted as adding the following, quote, we're not yet at a stage where I have a very clear monetization strategy because we haven't really talked about it, period, close quote. Now, these are quotations, I think, from the Wall Street Journal. These are quotations that are guaranteed, I'm here to guarantee it, that'll bring down the wrath of the gods, will they not? You can't say these things out loud. You know, back in 98, 99, companies were valued because they didn't generate any money or much revenue in the way uh, on eyeballs. The number of eyeballs that a dot-com company was generating from its website. Now we've come almost full circle. I mean, people for the last couple of years have said, well, startups and VC are not as bad as the last, you know, kind of cyclical upsurge because these are real businesses that generate real revenue. But I think that kind of quote undermines everything that people have said to kind of support this bull market in private companies. Well, it is also public companies. It is really something. And I think it uh, is certainly a sign of the times, obviously a sign of the times. More particularly, it's a sign of the, the uh, omnipresent effects of the radical monetary policies of the past 10 years and the crushing of the cost of capital. No? And I'd also just add hubris. I mean, you're, what's the, the, the unspoken uh, implication of, of those words is that, you know, capital will always be there for you um, and you don't need to, you don't need to sustain your, your business on your own. And so, you know, that, that to me is hubris. Yeah, uh, SendPro online from Pitney Bowes is not a hubristic point of product uh, through which you can send packages and mail without uh, leaving your office uh, just right from your desk for as low as $4.99 a month. And for being a grants listener, you'll receive a free 30-day trial to get started. As an added bonus, you'll also receive a free 10 pound scale shipped right to your door to help you accurately weigh your packages. So save time, money, no matter what you send from packages to overnights and letters, just click send and save with this new offer from SendPro Online. So with the aforementioned $4.99 a month, you can uh, print shipping labels, stamps, your own printer, easily compare rates using the online software that you will receive gain access to special USPS savings for letters, priority mail shipping, plus track all of your shipments and get email notifications when they have arrived. So go to pb.com slash grants pod to access this special offer and get a free 30 day trial plus a free 10 pound scale to get started. That's pb.com slash grants pod. Experience the better way to ship with a free trial of SendPro online from Pitney Bowes. Thank you, Pitney Bowes. And now we have Sabrina Fox joining us. Sabrina is the executive advisor for the European Leverage Finance Alliance, which is a trade group that tries to argue for better terms for creditors and also to educate the market. Before this, Sabrina was the uh, head of European High Yield Research at Covenant Review. She was a lawyer at DLA Piper, where she actually helped arrange high yield loans and, and bonds. So she's been on kind of all sides of the market. Uh, Sabrina, can you tell us a little bit about Alpha before we begin? Sure. The European Leverage Finance Alliance, or ELFA, was created at the beginning of this year by a core group of investors in the high-yield bond market who have been around for a long time. 
Um, and it, it's a recognition of the even greater need now than ever for investors to have a platform to express their views to the market, for education, to increase engagement, and just generally be supportive of the growth and liquidity uh, and resilience of the European leveraged finance market. And we're also open to loan investors as well. So there's, there's been lots of convergence between loans and bonds, and there are actually lots of desks that trade for, you know, firms that trade in both. Um, as a recognition to that, we are, but our membership is, is across bonds and loans. Uh, Sabrina, what are your put-upon members saying today about the credit market? What, what are they saying about bonds, loans, the general investment market, kind of their worries, how they see the world? I think the, the main issues that investors have uh, currently are, are sort of neatly fall within our three initiatives for 2019. Um, and those relate to disclosure, transparency, and engagement. On the disclosure side, the offering document that investors use to form their investment decisions contains a summary of the covenants, which are the protections afforded to investors and restrictions that are placed on, on companies. These covenants over the years have got more and more complicated and as such reflect greater risk. And the time that investors have to consider these covenants has actually got shorter. So whereas you may have had a week three or four or five years ago, now investors get perspectives, which is, you know, upwards of three, 400 pages, and they've got three days to consider the credit analysis, covenant analysis, and make an investment decision. The disclosure hasn't really changed much, even though covenants have got more complicated. So on the disclosure side, investors are interested to ensure that they stay on top of covenant flexibility to be able to adequately price risk and, and identify risk if, if, you know, if it becomes a necessity to do so if, uh, down the line. Transparency is, is a big one. Um, the public securities market is, you know, high yield market in Europe um, is, is sort of a pseudo public market in the sense that some issuers distribute financial information behind password protected websites. Um, and that creates a, an information asymmetry that, that can inhibit liquidity and indeed sometimes provide an advantage to a stress issuer who may not provide a password to certain investors who are, are trying to obtain one. Um, and then in, engagement is, is really just this recognition that investors need to have a forum to express their views on these issues and other issues. And also, you know, there, there's been less discussion during roadshow meetings on covenant flexibility. Um, over the years, and, and obviously as covenants have got more complicated, that discussion really has become more important than ever. So engagement is, you know, is also, we want to encourage that by, by bringing those discussions back into the room, uh, and there are a number of ways that, that we're trying to do that. So those are the primary concerns that, you know, investors want to be able to consider and understand, have the time to understand documents that form the basis for their investment decisions, uh, they want information flow to be freely available, and you know, they, they want to have the ability to engage on these issues effectively with issuers. Can we swing back to transparency? If I'm not mistaken, there was a fantastic article in the Wall Street Journal on Monday that quoted you. And if I understand the gist of it correctly, in the EU, like in the U.S., there's certain rules that when you float a public bond, you have to disclose certain information, including financial information. However, European issuers have been mm -hmm. able to take advantage of this weird irregularity where Guernsey, which is a English Channel island and is technically outside of the EU rules, is al allowing these companies to basically issue bonds and tell nobody basically nothing. Market abuse um, regulation. It, it, it applies to inside information and lots and lots of other things. And it does apply to European exchanges. So there definitely has been a, a whole host of issuers who have chosen to issue their, or list their bonds on the offshore exchanges, it's not just because they want to keep their information private, though some of them may have that consideration in mind. The other reason is that MAR imposes very onerous obligations on, on uh, keeping whitelists and training personnel for this purpose and can be very costly, especially for smaller, you know, relatively smaller companies issuing high yield debt. We actually had a really active dialogue when we, we wrote a study on password protected websites, which is what was uh, cited in the Wall Street Journal article. And we had a really active and productive dialogue with all of the listing agencies on this point. And the difficulty for them is that MAR doesn't actually explicitly prohibit 
these uh, password protected websites or you know uh, or 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 you know restrict the ability of an issuer to do that it it just is sort of against the spirit of the regulation because it requires that all material information be made public so you know the offshore exchanges are in an obviously better position in the sense that mark clearly does not apply to them so from an eu regulatory standpoint it's a much more straightforward analysis and for the eu exchanges you know it can be difficult for an issuer to get comfortable that they can use a password protected website um, but that isn't to say that some of them don't don't use it anyway do you have a sense of what proportion of uh, sub investment grade bonds and loans in europe are issued in these jurisdictions and basically don't tell people you know financial information unless they uh, are able to get to this password protected website is it a small proportion a large proportion so uh, according to bloomberg data um of, of sort of public high yield issuers, sorry, private high yield issuers, that is high yield issuers in Europe that don't have publicly listed equity. Upward third of issuers uh, are putting their information behind password protected websites. And a further, say, 5% contain, you know, may not put them behind password protected websites that require a click-through representation that an investor is, you know, will keep the information that they receive confidential, uh, which is tantamount to requiring them to sign an NDA. And the study that we did on, on password protected websites included an investor survey, which showed that you know, half of the people who responded to our survey, and we surveyed over 50 investors, had ruled out an investment in a company that had, has, is using password protected websites. So that is a clear signal that, you know, that this is an issue that, that is very important to them. You spent four years as the um, European head of Covenant Review. How is research published on uh, companies if you have to sign an NDA before you can actually look at the financials. How does this impact, I guess, the market's ability to know what is in a bond, how a company is faring, et cetera? It, it's, it can be a real inhibition to research um, and and also, um, you know, press and, and journalists reporting on, on these companies. Um, and, and that's another big concern. You know, genuine independent third party research is very helpful to the market and obviously providing, you know, uh, financial press with access to companies also keeps information flow going. Um, it, it's a real problem and I, I anecdotally heard recently that an issuer who had previously provided a password to journalists had taken them off the distribution list. Um, and that may have been because they were concerned about there being bad press about their performance. Uh, because you're not naming the issuer, did the journalist in question actually say something bad about the company specifically? No, no, it, it wasn't. It wasn't sort of like a um, you know a punishment or anything. So, so having said that, the use of this practice does put that that power in the hands of companies that, you know, they can just decide. They have the discretion to decide who gets the password and who doesn't. Is it possible to compare and contrast, I, I guess, Covenants and the level of protection in um, in bonds and loans in the U.S. versus Europe. Like, are are investors worse off in Europe? Are they better off? Like, has this competition led to, you know, much worse uh, covenant packages? I can't say that Europe has worse covenant packages than the U.S. I mean, covenant flexibility has grown significantly globally, and and at times the U.S does stand out as a leader in new covenant technology, as it's called. Um, but <laughs> That's a great Europe, term, by I the way. So, so you're saying we're number one. Yeah. Uh, America is great again. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in Europe, it's, you know, in, in the U.S., lots of these more aggressive covenants will be kept in the sponsor world. So if you're an investor investing in a bond that's owned by a sponsor company, you kind of know what you're getting. Whereas the corporate bond issuers tend to keep their covenants a bit more circum, you know, circumscribed and, and a bit more conservative and at least tailored to business. In Europe, there tends to be a greater tendency towards precedent so that even, you know, a, let's say a big sponsor would put out lots of aggressive terms um, and then, a, you know, middle market sponsor will use those same terms and then even a smaller sponsor and a smaller deal. And then those terms get carried over even into, you know, the regular corporate deals and to the point where the covenant flexibility, which is present across the board, is greater, you know, there's a threat more aggressive than in the U.S. where you tend to see a more tiered approach. You know, sponsor covenants are going to be the most aggressive 
uh, and non-sponsor companies will be less aggressive. So the, the, the precedent approach in Europe, I think, has created more broad covenant erosion than what is present in the U.S. And just to clarify for listeners, by sponsor you mean uh, private equity-led companies, and non-sponsor you mean basically just cor- right. corporations. So, so basically there's a dichotomy in the U.S. where private equity-led companies tend to have worse packages and co- uh, just normal corporates tend to have better ones, whereas in Europe everything is bad. Pretty much. <laughs> so the ECB stopped buying corporate bonds at the end of 2018. Has there been any improvement in yield or terms in the European uh, loan or bond market since that time? I mean, not not really. You know, the, the ECB is pulled away, but there is still more money coming into, you know, to be put to work. Um, and the supply in the first quarter was pretty poor. So that dynamic of supply and demand has kept the advantage still for the borrowers or and the issuers rather, you know, than, than the investors and the lenders. And the thing about covenant capacity or covenant flexibility is it doesn't ever really go back in the other direction. I mean, yields may ebb and flow, but covenant flexibility only really goes one way. What, what is the prevailing yield on, I guess, uh, European high yield bonds? Like what is high yield today? Not very high. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in pricing. I can tell you all you want to know about covenants, but but I do know that you know it it, it is not uh, you know co- investors are not being compensated for the risk they're taking on. I mean, I think everyone agrees uh, agrees on that. Okay, and this doesn't have to be from your capacity as um, an advisor to Alpha, but I, I'd love to kind of get examples of what are the kind of covenant packages you see in loans and bonds today. Um, what is something that may be representative or or just atypically bad? Like, what, what's coming across the desk today? I mean, you, you've worked, again, arranging deals, you've worked uh, rating deals, and now you work trying to make deals better for buyers. So the market has really changed since I was, you know, a baby lawyer learning how to do these deals. I mean, back in the day, you would basically just compare basket sizes, and the rest of the flexibility could be bespoke or standard, but you wouldn't expect to see lots of sort of hidden flexibility. Um, What do you mean mean by hidden flexibility? And so to give you an example, it it used to be the case that if you were going to be calculating a consolidated leverage ratio, you would be looking at debt and EBITDA. Now when you're calculating a consolidated leverage ratio, you may be looking at debt, but maybe not all of the debt. There may be certain debt baskets which are excluded. And when you're looking at EBITDA, you're looking at EBITDA, which is pro forma for synergies and add back. And, you know, in a way that can be very aggressively used um, to fit the, you know, the agenda of the sponsor. And then you've got even more flexibility. Previously, you'd be calculating the leverage ratio on the day you wanted to do something. So on this day, I want to borrow this debt, and I can meet my ratio, so I can do it. Now, companies have the flexibility to calculate ratios, perhaps when they enter into an agreement for a transaction, or when they enter into a commitment to borrow a debt. But there, there may be months between that point and when they actually execute the transaction or actually borrow the debt. And during that time, you can imagine, particularly for cyclical companies, there may be a dip in EBITDA, which could result in their not having been able to meet that leverage ratio on the day that the transaction of the debt is, you know, that transaction is actually is actually executed. So that creates two problems. Companies have more flexibility to decide when they want to calculate covenant capacity. And two, the flip side of that is investors have less visibility into what those capacity calculations might look like. They don't know exactly when that time will come that the company decides this is the point that I've got best numbers to calculate my capacity, so I'm going to make this calculation now. Investors might not find that out until the next quarterly report comes out, um, and you know by that time the, the action's already been taken. And that level of flexibility where discretion to make calculations at particular, you know, at a particular time or to, you know, to decide that certain EBITDA adbacks and synergies are reasonable um, has really put that, that discretion in the hands of private equity sponsors and companies and removed a level of transparency for investors. Okay. And in terms of 
companies basically only giving financial information to a privileged few. What has that done to liquidity? Like if I bought a high yield bond of, um, I don't know, like um, Altice Europe, um, and if Altice had issued that bond in Guernsey and has a password protection website about their financials, like how can I sell that bond to somebody else? Uh, how, how Is it more difficult now that they actually have to ask permission to get the financial information? What, what has that done to, I guess, liquidity and trading? I mean, I think for the large issuers, it, it won't inhibit liquidity. I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. But, you know, it, where it's really going to be an issue is going to be for the smaller companies and co- the smaller companies during a time when they may not be doing as well. But even still, what we realized when we did the, our study on password-protected websites is that some companies are doing this just because they can. And they may not realize that the practice has, uh, you know, it inhibits liquidity in their bonds. And it certainly is the case for, you know, the smaller um, tranches of, of debt. I mean, if they knew that, they probably wouldn't do it. Um, so that's why we're trying to raise awareness about the issue. Uh, when you talk to issuers about the impact uh, on the trading of their bonds and ability to kind of issue new bonds going forward, what do they say about this? Well, we haven't talked to them yet. We invited them to, to submit um, views in a survey. Um, but we are still working to engage directly with them to have this conversation. We've sent the study to all of the companies that were using password-protected websites, and our hope is that we can engage with them. We're having lots of success engaging listing agencies, um, all of the, the th- three main agencies, the Euro NTS, um, the Global Exchange Market and the International Stock Exchange in Guernsey have agreed to work with us to come up with guidelines that will make issuers aware of the concerns of investors and the potential impact on liquidity and also potentially pricing and access to the capital markets of adopting this practice. Um, are there any particular trends or uh, bonds or loans that you'd like to call to our attention just that you think are worrying or, or signs of the time? market one of the one of the issues that our our members are really focused on is the use of whitelist so a whitelist is uh, is a list of investors that that the loan can be transferred to so that current holders of the loan know that they can transfer the loan to to these other holders um, and those restrictions used to fall away upon an event of default the whitelist creates a a difficult dynamic for loan investors because you don't want to end up on it. And, you know, it can become an issue if, if, you know, say you push back on terms in a loan, you don't want to worry that the next deal that comes that comes down, you're going to end up, you know, you're not going to end up on the whitelist, you're going to end up off the whitelist. In the U.S., the same transferability restrictions are done by way of a blacklist. So there are certain funds that end up on the blacklist they can't sell to. So it's kind of the other way around. Um, I think the transferability restrictions in Europe are a real issue for our members and it's certainly something that that they, you know, that they want us to, you know, to to try to raise awareness on, to engage with, you know, with the market on and, and to try to reduce reliance on those just because they create a kind of it put too much discretion in the hands of the company, and particularly after you know an issuer is defaulting or a borrower is defaulted, you know you want to have the ability to to trade out of the loan if that's not an appropriate investment for you anymore. So that is certainly an an issue to keep an eye on. And then I think the you know the EBITDA adback issue is a huge one too. There's no reason why there should be a cap on those. I just I, I always say to investors if you want to pick. One provision that if you haven't, you know, if you have the ability to change the covenant package for the better during the marketing period for a bond or a loan, it would be to put a cap on EBITDA at back. Because EBITDA as a metric is used now in almost every single covenant in, in the, um, you know, in the covenant package. So what if you want to pay dividends, you look at the leverage ratio. If you want to, you know, it's not just debt and liens anymore. Um, if you want to sell the company and avoid having to, you know, put the bonds back to bondholders at 101, you have to meet a leverage ratio. And all of those leverage ratios use EBITDA. And that EBITDA can be subject to significant addbacks for synergies, which could create a situation where, you know, a company is not manufacturing synergies, but is certainly looking very, very hard to, you know, to find them so that they may be able to take advantage of flexibility to, you know, the PE sponsor to sell the company without having to, to offer bondholders a one-on-one put that can be very expensive. So that's, that's another one to keep an eye on. And then obviously, 
you know, any new types of covenant flexibility as they emerge are, are signs of the times. I mean, there's, there's a provision that allows companies to convert dividend capacity into debt capacity. And whenever covenants like that start to converge, I, I get a little bit worried. What does that mean? So if a, a company is able to pay dividends or able to raise debt, how, how does that work out? So basically, um, the way the provision works is that if the company has what they call restricted payments capacity, they can decide that rather than using that capacity for dividends, they can use it to borrow debt. Some, there are several variations of this provision. Some permit debt to be issued in lieu of any dividends. Some will only permit it for certain baskets. And, and in terms of what the debt can look like, I mean, some will allow that debt to be secured. So then you're looking at, you know, secured debt capacity from dividend capacity. I mean, it, it, at a certain level, you just think this doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, it's like how... You know, some covenant packages, in fact, probably most of them now, use a net leverage ratio in a high-yield bond covenant rather than growth. And the difference there is you get to net out cash, but the very next day you get to use the cash for something else. Then it doesn't really make sense <laughs> to use that kind of calculation. Um, so, you know, it's just uh, it's just another example of, of finding all of the full four corners of the covenant package and combining them in any way that creates additional flexibility. And I promise you that private equity sponsors right now are preparing themselves for a potential downturn in the cycle. You know, if you look at certain covenants that seem designed to give them advantages in, in a potential, you know, in a distress situation. So, for example, there were a number of deals in January of last year that came out with the ability for the private equity sponsor to pay itself dividends even when the company was in default. <laughs> um, now that raised a lot of red flags for us over Covenant Review, so we put out a market alert and said, you know, this is unacceptable. This is what we call the default blocker it needs to be reinstated in these deals. It's key protection for investors. And in two of the four deals, it, it was reinstated. Have there been so, any subsequent you know, deals after those uh, of, four deals that came to the market after January of last year? Oh, absolutely. In, in fact, there, you know, in in. <laughs> In some deals, it's got even worse than that. Just taking this all together, so yields are very low, uh, covenant packages are very weak, companies can pay dividends or take out debt even when they're in default. What does this all mean when we actually get into the next um, you know, cyclical downturn? Like, w What's going to happen to investors and recoveries and returns? So recoveries will be lower. I think everyone agrees on that. Um, the unfortunate consequence of light in the loan world means that investor uh, lenders will not be able to engage with borrowers as early as they used to be able to when maintenance covenants might have provided, you know, the opportunity for them to meet with an issuer, a, you know, a borrower who needs, you know, needed a covenant holiday or, or needed a consent. Um, those were opportunities for um, borrowers and lenders to come to get to the table. The issue now will be liquidity. What's going to, you know, a company is going to end up you know, in a worse situation by the time investors actually get to the table. And that's going to, to be an issue. I would say so. Financial innovation, <laughs> isn't it great? Well, Sabrina, this has been simply fantastic, uh, if uh, somewhat scary. Thank you so much for joining us today. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Sabrina Fox. That was merely terrific. And uh, thank you, Eric and Evan and Phil. And especially you, our listeners, ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk to you soon. This is Jim Grant on behalf of The Current Yield.